water um, and suffocation, all of this failed. Uh, the fire had created its own draft, and it was so hot that it actually cracked rock 300 feet above the roof of the top. Um, and really, the only solution was to block the ends and let it burn. Is that what the, would the fire walls at each end of the tunnel take away the air that the fire needed yeah, to burn? Yeah, that's, um, that's the idea. If you can block it quickly, then you can prevent some of that. But still, there's a lot of oxygen inside of a tunnel that big. Uh, nowadays, when I when I walked into it, it's it's impressive. There's a draft that goes through, so you can just imagine as it's spreading through these dry uh, timbers. And there's a lot of speculation as to what caused it. The vacuum from the fire actually sucked the curtains right inside. Anyway, they I helped put the curtains up, mm -hmm. and they, what happened was the volume of air in there was so heavy. When you we tried lowering them behind a train, and when you did, the vacuum was so heavy just pull the curtains right off. Yeah. So it didn't do any good to put for a fire, you know. Yeah. Um, he actually lives on the north end of Island Mountain. Or you have a house there, correct? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, you had a picture of it. I know. <laughs> and we, we were just talking uh, before my presentation, and I asked him if you remembered a helicopter going by in September of 2015. I remember you were waving at us. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> What did you say? Never shot at you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We did enough dumb things that day. I didn't do anything else. <laughs> so uh, this is something that came up on uh, train orders, and um, you can see at this point it's actually blocked, and you can see the the actual um, the black on the uh, the portal of the tunnel. So um, they decided to rebuild it. This is a picture from um, MK. They were the same company that actually did the uh, flood damage repair. Um, it was roughly 1,600 feet that was actually damaged. I believe actually 1,300 feet collapsed. Um, and what happened was is the type of soil that's there, as you actually dig through it, it's basically like sand. Um, in fact, the Shively Tunnel, which I've walked through with my buddy, um, it's actually made through an old seafloor deposit. So there's fossils that come out from behind the tunnel line. It was a great Mother's Day gift. <laughs> fossils. Um, so many believe that it would be rebuilt in a matter of months, um, but really the crews had to wait for the rock to cool before inspection was even possible. How long did that was that for the rocks to cool? Um, from what I've read, it was about two weeks. Do you have any insight on that? How long it took for people to get back? I don't in? remember exactly. I know that I couldn't get to my cabin. I had to drive around the ranch for a long time, but I, it's been too many years. I don't remember the, the time yeah. frame. I know that there was a long time cooling before they could get in there and work. Right. Yeah, and I know that once it was, that they were able to actually go inside. Of course, because of the poisonous gases that are in there, you have to aerate it a little bit. And they went inside and they found that there was a massive amount of damage. Um, so this is actually, uh, you can see some of the crews actually working on it. Um, what they were doing is, is they were actually taking these machines and they were digging um, through the top of it and then they would step it down and they would continue to do that. And once they started to actually put steel on the inside of it, they would start using this stuff called shotcrete and it's basically like a pneumatically applied uh, concrete. And the reason why NWP didn't do this um, throughout all of the tunnels is I believe because of cost. and it's difficult to mix that much concrete for some of these really long tunnels. It's um, almost all concrete. Yeah. So um, you can actually see here some of the crews, they've actually gotten down to the base rock here, or the, the base level of the tunnel. Um, and this is where it gets really interesting. So I didn't expect to find any of this, but when I was actually looking in the Humboldt room, I started finding these newspaper clips. And a lot of them were basically indicating that people weren't so sure if this thing was going to reopen. So um, you can see right here it says Engineer Lynch said that the tunnel was reconstruction was manageable but very expensive with the rebuilding work estimated at 50 to 60 feet a week. Um, also said Lynch said that three weeks ago an entire crew was fired after they walked off the job on Friday to party. <laughs> <laughs> so Don Clawson, our congressman, went down to visit this and. Shortly after, uh, people were feeling really optimistic. Oh, the congressman is there. It, it's going to actually get rebuilt. And then not long after, 
Uh, Southern Pacific actually sent something to the Times Standard, and they published a, uh, a map, and it had a dotted line through the canyon, and it said, soon to be abandoned. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, people in the north end were going, what? This is strange. Um, and effectively what had happened is, is the cost had become too high, and the easiest way to cut the losses would be to just abandon the railroad. And cut it off basically to Willits. Um, and really what I found going through a lot of this is that there was a lot of confusion as to what was happening. Um, you can see here the headline is, railroad officials are meeting coy on their intentions. Um, so Don Clawson actually published a statement, to this end I want to make it very clear that in representing people of Humboldt and Mendocino, as well as everyone on the North Coast, I will oppose any effort to abandon rail service to our area. I will convey this opposition in the most forceful terms to the ICC. I feel certain that the long-standing and mutual profitable relationship between NWP and our area is one that you will want to continue. Well put. Um, and during this time, there was actually a power shortage on the Southern Pacific Railroad, so they wanted to actually recover some of the locomotives um, that were stranded in Eureka. Uh, there were eight of these SD9s. Um, if you've ever seen an SD9 before, they weigh 160 tons. They're absolutely massive, and they're complicated machines. So what they decided to do to recoup some of this money, because they needed to send it to more important railroads, was move it. Yeah. Yeah. And they rebuilt, actually they had to like completely rebuild a bridge in Trinity County because this section of the railroad is technically in Trinity County. Um, and they actually did this, I believe it was four times, and then they realized it was not worth it. What creek is that right there? I'm what not track? actually sure. Um, some of these pictures that I found, they, they were just talking about the actual day. And I know that uh, specifically in this, uh, one of these, uh, there's footage of it almost rolling over. They moved those locomotives to Sacramento, put them in the yard there. They, I could see them from my office for five years. They never did a thing with them. They finally scrapped them. Oh. What a waste. After moving them all, yeah. <laughs> So um, the total move amounted to almost $1 million, and of course, SP realized it wasn't worth it. So what happens, and this is really what I want to drive home here, um, this is something that the railroad can't recover from, this tunnel fire. It ends up being closed for 15 months, and the lumber industry locally ends up feeling the pinch. Um, so they start losing uh, customers, and a lot of people start, a lot of these companies start switching to long-term trucking contracts. Um, so SP decides to discontinue the service, and at this point they're still sort of saying that we're going to uh, fix the tunnel, but then they're also saying that we're not going to fix the tunnel, and it is just as confusing as it sounds on my mouth. That's how it looked when I was looking at these newspapers. I'm like trying to piece the dates together, and I'm like, what are they trying to do? Like, what actually happened? Did you have that hand up? Or? No? Okay. There's, there's, uh, there's more on those locomotives. The, um, the railway started to move them because they wanted them, and then the, um, they were going to move them down the highway, and they said, no, we won't give the county, Humboldt County told them that we couldn't give them a permit to do that, yeah. so they were going to take them over Bell Springs Road, and um, oh, wow. they, yeah. they applied for a permit to do it, and Humboldt County shut them down and says, no, you can't, because they wanted the locomotives to stay here so that they would rebuild the Yeah, and that, that was one of the things where after they did all of this, it was like, yeah. Wow, and then they ended up rebuilding it, and the whole thing was for nothing. So, um, they ended up applying for abandonment, but there was protest, obviously. All of the same areas that I mentioned before that were united by the railroad um, actually signed uh, something that was submitted to the railroad saying, we really do not want you to discontinue service because we need you. Um, so, eventually, with enough um, public persuasion, they end up reopening it, and this is in October of the next year, 79. So uh, despite confusion and taking longer than a year, it finally reopened. It cost them $19 million for basically 1,600, 1600 feet of track that was destroyed, um, 69 feet of tunnel. Uh, it's worth noting that, and I know there's a difference in the uh, inflation, of course, but the original railroad cost $14 million. 
And this tunnel has then cost them 19 to rebuild in 1978 dollars. This was actually taken by Derek Spiritalazzi. He's a guy who uh, hiked um, a lot of this railroad, and he uh, did some rafting also. And he took a picture of this. This is inside the tunnel, and you can actually see. It says, December 10th, 1979, first train after the fire. And I, as of 2015, that was still in there. Um, so, despite the reopening of the tunnel, um, the year absence of service caused many customers to shift to trucking. Um, so in 1982, the NWP moved just 16,000 carloads over its trackage, a mere fraction of the 65,000 it moved in 75, oh, wow. which means it was a drop of 75%. Oh, okay. And when I saw those numbers, I realized that I was kind of on to something here. The fact that, and I had heard of this, people said, oh, the tunnel fire is a big deal, but I never really looked at like the data to see if that was something that was uh, realistic to um, sort of like hypothesize and I really think that this is one of the reasons why it never recovered and it doesn't get better. Um, so in 1983 Southern Pacific uh, instated a $1,200 surcharge for every rail car heading south from Eureka or north from Willows. Wow. If a car passed through the canyon it costs an extra $1,200. Wow. Huh. Does that seem like it's profitable? <laughs> this was an attempt to cope with the high cost of the deteriorating canyon. So you have this nice, beautiful, shiny new tunnel, and the canyon is failing all around it. Um, however, the move now made the railroad more expensive than trucking, so it doomed the business, which is exactly what SP wanted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they were basically doing it to themselves at this point. And then a little bit later, if you look at the date here, 83, you're actually seeing headlines where people are complaining that the NWB is making it hard for them to actually ship things. Um, I've read that in the 1983, during the summer, they said it was a very quiet time during, in the canyon. Not a lot of trains running, and for this reason. Um, and the railroad wanted to halt repairs. Um, I really think this is, this is amazing right here. One former railroad man wept as he described the NWP's decline. The cutback in maintenance led to weakened tracks, unsafe rail cars, fire prone tunnels, and a collapsing rail bed, according to workers and instructors. That line is going to hell. And then there's another tunnel fire. And I only told you about the 78 one. There, was, there were a lot of tunnel fires on NWP. Um, so they ended up filing for abandonment a second time in 1983. Uh, September 11th of that same year, a second tunnel fire broke out near Longvale, 12 miles north of Willits. Um, SP saw it as a final death knell for the Willits to Eureka block. Um, and they wanted to rebuild, uh, or they did not want to rebuild the tunnel because it was over $600,000 to do so, and they didn't want to do it because it was already so financially broken. Um, so they did hold these meetings with the president of SP, and he stated it was costing an average of a million dollars each month to maintain the line between Willits and Eureka. I've actually read that for every $20 SP made in the canyon, something like 13 of it went to maintenance. That's not sustainable. And their losses total about seven million dollars. I included this. I took this by the air. Just shows you the kind of railroad we're talking about. This is not a railroad that was traveling through the Great Plains. This took some serious um, effort to keep going. So they actually, um, with the help of a federal judge, determined that uh, re not rebuilding the tunnel um, by not rebuilding it, SB had illegally abandoned the railroad north of Willits and they were actually forced yet again to keep the line open. Um, so they rebuilt the tunnel but continued to neglect everything else. So in 1984, um, a guy by the name of Brian Whipple, he was a railroad executive, he is actually still alive, I believe he's living down in Santa Rosa now. Um, he ends up purchasing the north end of the line from Outlet Creek to Eureka. So that's basically the creek right outside of Willits. The problem is, is that there's no customers between uh, Scotia and um, Outlet Creek at this time. So despite a strong spirit and renewed effort to maintain the canyon, there was, just wasn't enough capital to do the, maintain, uh, do the repairs needed for operations. Uh, they started doing excursion trains. This is the last time you saw passenger service on NWP. Um, it's not real passenger service because you had to ride it both ways. Um, but really this was a bad new deal because they got stuck with operating the worst segment of the line they would bring freight from the north end, 
drop it off to NWP and Willits, and NWP said, wow, thanks, and then they got to take it elsewhere, all while not maintaining the Yoever, which is the worst part. And there were zero customers at this time in the stretch from Scotia to Outlet Creek. Uh, and this meant that they collected it and didn't have to spend any money on the canyon, as Pete did then. So um, I've heard from a lot of people, they remember this short segment of time where a railroad where they uh, operated these really brightly colored locomotives. Um, I love this shot because it just shows you how insane the geology is here. This picture was actually taken by uh, my friend James. His, his dad um, actually took this picture because he rode um, on the... This is one of the early trips of the North Coast Daylight. Um, he actually mentions in this next slide that um, you can see uh, in the tightness of the curves, the 75 foot cars are actually leaning to the inside. And I've heard from people who rode the North Coast Daylight, if you would lean out the cars, sometimes you would see ballast moving out from under the tracks. <laughs> it's called Paul Derrick Ballast. <laughs> yeah. That's a northbound train. Mm -hmm. Right there, that's a northbound train. Yeah. And it took, I think, 10 hours. Just north Island, not in Yep. 